Hello. I hope you are keeping safe and healthy. My name is Dr. Shazi Khouri, and I teach in the History, Religion, and Society Department at King's Academy. The title of my presentation is Disease and Discrimination, Epidemics and Segregation in the United States, South Africa, and Palestine, Israel, 1918-2020. Thank you for joining. Let's begin by considering what's in a name. You may remember that President Trump defended calling the coronavirus the Chinese virus on March 18th of this year. Over the next two weeks, a website launched by a professor at San Francisco State University recorded over 1,000 racially motivated attacks on Asian Americans. You may also know that the influenza of 1918-1919 was and is still commonly called the Spanish flu. According to historian John M. Barry, Spain actually had few cases of influenza before May 1918, but the country was neutral during the First World War. That meant the government did not censor the press, and unlike French, German, and British newspapers, which printed nothing negative, nothing that might hurt morale, Spanish papers were filled with reports of the disease, especially when King Alfonso XIII fell seriously ill. In a way, we can say that Spain was punished for covering the epidemic more honestly and widely than the warring countries, including the United States. In fact, if we search the American press of the period, we find that there was some recognition even then that this terminology was not accurate. As reported in the Fernandina News Record of Florida in October 1918, although King Alfonso of Spain was one of the victims of the influenza epidemic in 1893 and again this summer, Spanish authorities repudiate any claim to influenza as a Spanish disease. If the people of this country do not take care, the epidemic will become so widespread throughout the United States that soon we shall hear the disease called American influenza. Indeed, the term Spanish flu has stuck, even when it is often put in quotes, and so has the debate about its appropriateness, as this article in the Spectator magazine, rather, from this year demonstrates. The point I submit here is that the accuracy or inaccuracy of the name Spanish or Chinese for the origins of a disease is irrelevant. Using these terms ascribe nationality to microbes, which is nonsensical. It is also falsely comforting, especially in our globalized modern world, as it puts the disease over there. Most importantly, it is othering or stigmatizing to another group or population. The influenza pandemic of 1918-1919 may have killed up to 100 million people worldwide or 5% of the population of the globe. This would be equal to the entire population of the United States at that time. About one quarter of the US population of 1918 of 100 million persons were infected by influenza. Around 675,000 died. More American casualties than World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War combined. That proportion of the population would be more than two and a quarter million Americans today. Vanessa Northington Gamble writes that in stark contrast to the higher disease rates of African Americans for tuberculosis and pneumonia, it appears that during the influenza epidemic, African Americans were less susceptible than white Americans to influenza. Although the epidemic probably had a less devastating impact on African-American communities, it still overwhelms their medical and public health resources. Black influenza victims received care primarily in segregated facilities. One example of such a segregated facility was the 40-bed Providence Hospital, the only facility for the black population of Baltimore, Maryland at the time. The hospital had to turn patients away, 
which the local newspaper, the Baltimore Afro-American described as, quote, the pitiable results of the Jim Crow policy practiced in white hospitals in the city. This historical context of separate and unequal access to healthcare in America must be kept in mind when we turn to the disparities in coronavirus infection and death rates between black and white Americans that are being reported in the press today. It should be noted that the US Army, Army finally dropped its ban on black nurses in the weeks following the end of the First World War. Although they treated both black and white soldiers, the nurses continued to be housed in segregated quarters. This is one instance of African Americans' heroic agency and contributions in confronting the epidemic. Many other such examples could be noted. Another place where the influenza pandemic of 1918-1919 not only reinforced racial segregation, but also helped to institutionalize it was South Africa. As Howard Phillips, professor of history at the University of Cape Town notes, South Africa was one of the five worst hit parts of the world. Some 300,000 South Africans died in the first six weeks, or what would be 6% of the entire population. Phillips writes that the influenza epidemic pushed white medical and political authorities to pay rather self-interested attention to the living conditions of the non-white population. South African Minister of Public Health, Sir Thomas Watt remarked, colored people and natives must live under healthy conditions if the other members of the community are to remain healthy. Watt's point, in other words, is to attend to the health of black South Africans, not principally for their own sake, but because they could infect white South Africans. Also chronicling the intertwining of public health and racial politics, Susan Kingsley Kent reports that in South Africa, the Public Health Act of 1919, by removing poor white populations from slums and limiting its measures to white populations in urban centers, facilitated the racial segregation of cities and thus helped lay the groundwork for the system of apartheid that emerged in South Africa after 1948. The year 1948, of course, also saw the war that resulted in the creation of the State of Israel and the Palestinian Nakba, or catastrophe. Over half of the pre-war Palestinian population, some 470,000 persons, became refugees in the West Bank and Gaza Strip as fallout from that war. These territories were then placed under Israeli military occupation following the subsequent Palestinian and Arab defeat in the War of 1967 and remain so to this day, 53 years later. Last month, in March of 2020, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Occupied Palestinian Territories affirmed that Israel, as, quote, the occupying power, must ensure that all the necessary preventive measures available to it are utilized to combat the spread of contagious diseases and epidemics, end of quote, a responsibility deriving from Article 56 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Using biblical nomenclature in reference to the territory of the West Bank and echoing the concerns of the South African minister, Sir Thomas Watt mentioned earlier, Dalia Bassa, civil administration health coordinator of the Coordination of Government Activities in the Territories, or COGAT, observed that, quote, bacteria and viruses do not stop at the border, and the spread of the dangerous virus in Judea and Samaria can also jeopardize the health of the residents of Israel. Even though there is again this fear that the marginalized community can infect the privileged community, just over two weeks ago, on April 8th, it was reported that the Gaza Strip had run out of coronavirus testing kits for its population of 2 million. It was reported five days later 
on April 13th that Israel had allowed five testing kits purchased by the World Health Organization, or WHO, to enter the enclave, which together are capable of performing only about 480 tests. In striking contrast, last Thursday, the Israeli Health Ministry reported that it had conducted over 11,000 tests for Israeli citizens on that day alone. So these are some thoughts about disease, discrimination, and segregation drawn from the historical record of the United States and South Africa and from the contemporary case of Palestine, Israel. I invite you to consider the following questions. First, in what ways do public health crises highlight or exacerbate racial disparities and conflicts? That is, in what ways do epidemics make these problems more obvious and make them even worse? Secondly, in what ways do public health crises offer opportunities to ameliorate or repair racial disparities and conflicts? Or in what ways may such biological disasters actually provide pathways towards beginning to address and resolve these problems? I leave you with these two questions and others you may want to consider following this presentation. For our internal viewers, please click the link following this video to access the discussion thread, where we welcome your thoughts to these questions. For our external viewers, we welcome your thoughts too on your social media platform of choice using the hashtag COVID19KA. Thank you for your attention and engagement.